in this episode, like, everyone comes together, okay? And because, you know, th these guys, they're friends, right? And so because they're friends, they, uh, they all, remember that, like, golden ticket? So that was for, like, this huge, you know, party that's coming up. And so they all need a dress to go to this huge party. So all of, uh, so Rarity, she makes dresses, right? So all the main six, they come and they they want to have a dress made so they can go to this huge party and so you go to the specialist the person who is known for um for dresses which is which is rarity so they realize that like they're not going to make their own dress and they go to rarity and what's really interesting is like not necessarily like them saying look we should go to the specialist like Okay, that makes sense, right? Go to the specialist. Uh, but what's more important is like what happens after Rarity starts making, you know, these um, five dresses, is the way she she works with her clients. And I see this like so much um, with uh, a lot of like the the newer companies that I've worked with and that uh, learn about personal finance and investing, is like trying to suit everybody um, and trying to do what everybody wants to do. So having like this laundry list of uh, of things that you do. Uh, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And so in this uh, episode, what happens is Rarity starts making all these dresses, and then she's struggling. She's at a crossroads with herself and, more importantly, with sort of her artistic design. Because her friends, initially, they don't like it. They aren't feeling the, the dresses. Um, and so this is an insane song, but we're going to go through this and then elaborate on it. Stitching it together Twilight stress Cutting out the patterns Snip by snip Making sure the fabric falls nicely It's the perfect color and so hip Always got to keep in mind my pacing Making sure the clothes correctly facing I'm stitching Twilight stress Yard by yard Pressing on the details Jewel neckline don't you know a stitch in time saves nine? Make her something perfect to inspire Even though she hates formal attire Gotta mind those intimate details Even though she's more concerned with sales It's Applejack's new dress Dress making's easy For Pinkie Pie something pink Fluttershy something breezy Blend color and form, do you think it looks cheesy? Something brash, perhaps quite fetching Hook and I couldn't you just simply die Make it sure it fits for lock and crest Don't forget some magic in the dress Even though it rides high on the flank Rainbow won't look like a tank I'm stitching rainbow dress Piece by piece, snip by snip Creep duck hunch, shoulders hips Thread by thread and press yard by yard, never stress, and that's the art of the dress. Now, the stars on my belt need to be technically accurate. Orion has three stars on his belt, not four. Stitch by stitch, stitching it together. Deadline looms, don't you know the client's always right? Even if my fabric choice was perfect, gotta get them all done by tonight. Picky by the colors, too obtrusive. Wait until you see it in the light. I'm sewing them together. Don't you think my gown would be more me with some lollipops? Well, I think balloons. Well, do it! Hour by hour, one more change. I'm sewing them together. Take great pains. Flutter shy, you're putting me in a box. Have to pick up the pace, still hold to my vision. That constellation is Canis Major, not Minor. French haute couture, please. Ugh. What if it rhymes? Galoshes! More balloons! Oh no, that's too many balloons! More candy! Oh, less candy! Oh, wait, I know! Streamers! Streamers? Whose dress is this? Streamers it is. What? 
Aren't you going to tell me to change something too? No, I just want my dress to be cool. Do you not like the color? The color's fine, just make it look cooler. Do you not like the shape? The shape's fine, just make the whole thing, you know, cooler. It needs to be about 20% cooler. All we ever want is indecision. All we really like is what we know. Got a balanced style with adherence. Making sure we make a good appearance. Even if you simply have to fudge it. Make sure that it stays within our budget. Got to overcome intimidation. Remember it's all in the presentation. Piece by piece, snip by snip, group dog haunt, shoulders hip, bolt by bolt, trimmed and pressed, yard by yard, always stress, and that's the art of the dress. She falls over, dead, with, with tired, she's so just destroyed internally because she's listening to every single thing that her friends say, all of her clients, all of, you know, like it's their dress, sure, it's their dress, but it's her expertise, it's her specialty, it's what she is passionate about doing and what she's amazing at doing, what she's known for. She knows how to make dresses, but what she's trying, she's, you know, early in her career is listening to every single little thing the client says instead of just getting a product in their hands, just getting it done, getting it out there. This is such a huge, huge, huge distinction um, in, in like any aspect of like any project you're doing. It's this idea of planning, and I'll put it in quotes, and I'll tell you why I say, um, planning versus doing, okay? So like you can spend like five years planning something, but if you spend a week trying to make a, like a, a vase, say if you're doing pottery, you're making a dress, spend like a week trying to make a dress, it's not going to be as good as someone who spent like the first you know week planning and the next five years doing it. Um, now, obviously, like these are ex exaggerated time periods, but like you've got to get a product out there. You've got to get something out there. Just like do it first um, and stop spending so 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 much time planning. Uh, we don't have too much more time for this point, but it's it's so so important um, that when you're working, especially with clients, you separate the clients, you get the work done. You make it happen, and then you output that work. And you show, look, this is the final product. You know, small changes here and there, sure. But like, you're doing whatever work that, that it is that you do. You're not just like listening to, you know, like if you have a homework assignment, you're not showing it to your professor every 15 seconds and then saying, hey, what do you think I should change here um, for an English paper, right? You're not having him read through sentence by sentence. Oh, I don't like this one little word choice here. Like, it doesn't matter. You just get the product done. If you look at like groups of, um, of potters and you have like one group that spends six months studying all the best pottery books on the planet and then a month making one single vase that's supposed to be the best vase ever versus guys that spend like literally all six months just making pottery and the only thing that they want to do is make as much as possible. The quality of the guys that literally just do it over and over and over for six months versus the people that were told to make the best vase humanly possible by studying for five months and then just doing it at the end. This, this is like total crap. These guys that just did it over and over and over, their vases are amazing. They're way, way, way better because they took action and they created an end product and they just did it without focusing too much on what other people were saying, without focusing on criticizing, without focusing on like this planning stage that overtakes so much creativity and growth and just cuts off your action. You wanna focus on this action and only at the end do you ask your professor to grade your paper, do you ask someone to review your paper. That's the last stage. You only want revisions in that last stage. You have to isolate your creative process and um, the work that you do from you know, the people that, because you know, if I'm asking a chef to make me you know, a steak, like I don't wanna go into the kitchen and watch him make a steak. Um, you know, I might say, oh my God, you burned this, or you know, I don't like how you flipped it. Like, that's not the point. The point is the, out of the kitchen comes a plate and it looks delicious and it's got like sides and stuff. And so you wanna focus on that end result, that end product, and isolate um, you know, the other people, especially if you're working individually with people, you wanna isolate them from the process um, and be transparent, you know, tell them what you do, but you've just got to let it happen and do instead of focusing so much on um, people think about it. Um, okay, cool, cool, cool. So feeling pinky keen, this one is really funny. Um, and it's a little bit more about like gut, because gut is like so important. Um, 
at least I think it's ridiculous in financial markets. Like gut is, is it's huge. Um, and so that's why this is like really, this is a cool one. So Pinky's got like, you guys know Spider-Man, yeah? And he's got like his spider sense. So Pinky's got her pinky sense, whatever, right? And so she goes around town and, you know, say this is like town. Um, and she's just going around with her friends and people everywhere. And she just starts to like get twitches and you kind of see like her, her whole body moving. She just starts to go crazy. Cool trick. If you guys ever want to like get super energized, just like shake your ass a bunch. It's insane. It's so good. Like just, oh my God, it's great. Um, so, these, so, <laughs> so she starts to like shiver and then like depending on how she shakes, she kind of interprets like her body moving. And, um, and so like, you know, if her whole body shakes, like plants will fall. You can kind of see like Twilight's pretty beat up in this picture because the plant fell on her head. Um, you know, doors will open, you know, just crap happens and it's really weird. Um, and so the, the point with, um, you know, with this pinky sense is that it's, it's not logical. You know, it doesn't make sense. It, it, these guys, they don't really understand why, you know, she's got like casts on her feet because she like got opened a door, opened right into her. Um, and so like, she'll just like shake and like random stuff, which has happened. It's like really bad and messed up. And like, no one knows why there's, there's no reason why there's no point, but like it, it works, right? And it happens. And so through one way or another, she starts to gain like the most important thing you can have uh, in any position or any business or any aspect of your life, uh, which is respect. And she starts to gain the respect of the main six of her friends uh, of her pinky sense of, you know, this idea that like, if I shake, uh, I can interpret what that means and something crazy is gonna happen, uh, which is like super weird, but like, that's just kind of how it works. So as she starts to accrue this respect, she starts to grow and grow and grow. Um, this like pinky sense. All of a sudden, you know, her friends start to take her like a lot more seriously. And what's important about that is like, this is kind of like a weird bogus thing. But what's really weird is like, as the episode goes on, she is so positive about this sense. She takes it in as a good thing. Remember we talked earlier about this idea of like positive negative mindset and like you could interpret this as a bad thing. Like if you were thinking that like, oh my gosh, my leg shakes and you know, really like a, a cart falls over or a car crashes, uh, which happens. I mean, like that's, that's uh, probably could be interpreted as a bad thing, but she interprets, she takes it in and she says, you know what? This is a good thing. I'm going to use this as a benefit. I'm going to use this anomaly as a strength. Um, and not as an excuse to fail, not as a reason that I'm going to be weak, not as, you know, some BS about why um, she, she bakes like cupcakes for a living, why I can't make a living uh, as a baker. So she cuts that. She makes a distinct separation and she says, I'm going to, you know, embrace it. And when you embrace the new, she's able to leverage it and she's able to, you know, use it to go around town and help save people from random things happening, which is like ridiculously weird, but it's useful, right? And so this new thing comes into her life. She embraces it. She takes it as a positive strength. And then she gains respect from her peers about it. And now what's cool is she can use it to have an impact uh, because it's, it's part of her unique abilities now, right? This is a very, very you know, unique skill that nobody else has. And since she's like, able to expose it. She can leverage it in all aspects of her life uh, and go and be like the magical uh, person that can predict random things happening, which is like super cool, right? Um, and so what's the takeaway here, right? Well, the important part is to realize that, like this is weird and you can take it bad and you take it negatively, but we take it positively and you take it as a benefit and then you go out and you apply it and you use it. Like just like we we're talking about earlier with um, trying new things, like this is a new thing in her life. And so she goes and she just applies it. And she usually isn't like around town all the time doing crazy stuff. But this like whole episode just following her around and testing this stuff out. And her friends, you know, at the beginning, like Twilight, Applejack, they don't believe it. They don't have like any belief in, uh, in their friend. They think this is like a weird bogus thing. Wow, that was, that was weird. Um, they don't have any belief in their friend. And so their trust, their faith, is it's, it's none at the beginning, right? They're like, this is bogus, you know, there's no pinky sense. Um, but as they see it, they, they start to respect it. It becomes a reality. And for a lot of people, 
it, it takes a very, very long time to have faith in something. Um, but for these guys, it was different. They, they were a little bit more, they were a little bit faster. Um, and so, like, this obviously was a thing, right? It became a reality, uh, at least for this episode. And, like, it, once you have your faith level this high, like, it becomes real, right? And what happens is a lot of times something new comes. And, you know, a great example is blockchain technology. I remember uh, when, when Bitcoin, you guys know Bitcoin, like, it was starting off uh, pretty slow. And, you know, I was really in the, like, the stock investment space, the personal finance space, and mostly um, in day trading, right? In swing trading. And what was cool is, like, you know, it was, like, I don't know, 200 bucks, two grand, 1,800 bucks, something like that. The amount of faith you have in the system, if you start slow, you're going to invest very little. If you start fast, you're going to invest a lot more. Um, I started fast. I invested a lot more. It worked out really well. It also... I uh, went down a lot, but like the important thing to it's just, like not just in investments, but in like any aspect of your life where you have something new, a new technology, a new space, a new field, a new, you know, magic power, you can embrace it faster, faster and get involved in it now, have faith in it now, even like what's the worst that's happened, right? If you have full faith in something at the beginning. Um, you know, in our example, Bitcoin, you have full faith in it, you invest in it really, like you're going to do really, really well. Like if you have full faith in some new idea, like the worst thing that's going to happen is, you know, it plunks and it's not real. Same thing here. The worst thing that's going to happen is if you have faith in your friend that they're telling the truth and that they really do have this cool thing. Like the worst that's going to happen is that they just, you know, flunk out and they don't have anything and it goes to nothing and you look dumb for a little bit, but it's not a big deal. Um, and so often we'll see people, you know, like in social situations, right, where there's this new opportunity. Um, people are, you know, you're afraid, right, um, to get involved with a new opportunity. You're afraid to jump in and dive in full faith into what uh, could really be a very, very powerful movement or a new technology or a new idea, whatever, right? Wherever you have like something that could fundamentally shift the way that you work, the way you function, you jump into it with full faith. The worst thing that's going to happen is usually you look like an idiot, maybe lose a little bit of money. The best thing that's going to happen is like huge upside in personal growth, development, cash rewards, wh whatever, right? Um, it's like, you know, if there's an opportunity for like a job, you'll see like literally, you know, you guys know there's like hundreds of people that come to the school and they're trying to like, you know, get people to interview and do jobs and, um, you know, hire people basically. And, you know, a couple of those companies, and I was one of those companies, like they want employees. And you'll have like thousands of kids that don't have full faith. And it sucks. It sucks. It's so terrible. So you have like thousands of kids, that, and, and then, you know, you've got, you know, maybe 100 or 200 of them that are interested in like working for, you know, whatever company that comes. And then, I don't know, say it's like Boeing, okay? They interview, they, they want to interview and they want to hire like some guy. And maybe like, you know, of these kids, like half of them are juniors, seniors, whatever, and like able to work or, or whatever. Um, you'll have like literally hundreds of people that are able to do something, but because they don't have this full faith to embrace it, only like five people show up for the interview. And then like half of them get hired. So the takeaway here, be one of those early adopters. The downside is you waste half an hour in an interview. And that downside is enough to repel 90%, 95% of people. So be part of that, you know, 5%. It pushes through and takes in new worlds, new chances, and just go out on the limb on that one thing that could change it all. Because what you'll find is that a vast, vast, vast majority of people just don't have the balls to get started and do it. It's really crazy stuff. That's, it, it's like the exact thing that, um, you know, like when I was getting into financial markets, like, like nobody, like I was in high school, right? Like nobody was trading stocks. Um, but like that 1% of people that just start doing it, it's just, you had huge success. And when I started teaching people how to do it, like they had huge success. Um, and why was it? Well, they weren't afraid to have full faith in it at the beginning and just go hard and go all in with their beliefs. Because there's a small amount of risk for sure but there's a huge amount of upside. So just go hard, just go hard. All right, cool, cool, cool. So Sonic Rain Boom, here's, here's a really cool one. So this is, this is going hard. Um, so it kind of goes into the past a little bit, and then it's also kind of in the present, 
but it's like mostly in the past. <laughs> okay, so Rainbow Dash, she's like really good at flying, right? So like that's what she loves to do. And with the Wonderbolts, um, which is again that exclusive flying group, like she really likes to fly. Um, and she's really good at it. And that's like basically her job is like clear the, the clouds from the sky, but her job is basically to just fly around. Um, so, She's talking to like Scootaloo, who is another just young character. She's a young pony. And, you know, Scootaloo's like, well, hey, how did you, you know, start out? Where did you come from? Um, and they're also talking about like her history. So when she grew up, she grew up in this magical world uh, in the sky called Cloudsdale, okay? And in Cloudsdale, like, you have to kind of be like a Pegasus because you got to fly there because it's like floating in the sky. And it's just like this ginormous like collection of big clouds and it's like a whole city and that's where Rainbow Dash grew up right and so throughout this episode we were taken basically into like her childhood and what's cool is like she's going through this academy that's at Cloudsdale um, called Flight School you know Junior Speed to Flight School and in Flight School they're learning how to get really good at flying because obviously you know um, some of them are not good at flying and they gotta get good. Um, you go to school, you know, for whatever it is that you wanna get really good at, or you go through a program or a course or, or whatever. Um, so that's kinda, that's exactly what, you know, Rainbow Dash is doing at flight school. And so she's like super young, and there are some pretty, some pretty brutal uh, bullies and, and kids there. And they're all, you know, flying around, pretend these are ponies or flying horses, whatever, because uh, that's, that's a pretty good drawing, yeah. And they've got like this racetrack and this course that they go through and they have this huge like course. And so on this huge course, they decide that they're gonna have a race. And so, ooh, all right, that's pretty solid. Rainbow Dash comes in and, and the problem is, you know, she's right here in blue. And like some of these guys are pretty big jerks. And so they're like bullies basically, right? And Rainbow Dash, she went to flight school with Fluttershy, who's going to be kind of green-orange, I guess. I don't know. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there you go. So, Fl Rainbow Dash and Fluttershy, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty solid friends. They're young, but they're, they're making friends together. And these, these bullies are, you know, kind of jerks. They're, they're pissing her off. And so, what they decide to do is they have Fluttershy come over here, and they start, like, this big race. And the point of the race is, you know, the bullies versus Rainbow Dash, and then whoever wins the race is like the coolest person ever, right? You know, they're in like probably uh, grade school at this point. I don't know. And so Fluttershy starts the race. And these guys, whoo, they zoom, they take off, huge, huge, huge takeoff. Um, they just go whoo right past her and start going on this race. And what's interesting is like they um, they knock Fluttershy like off the course, right, off the track. And so she starts to kind of like fall, fall um, towards the ground. And she's like going towards the ground. It's, uh, and she, or she's a Pegasus, so she can like stand on the clouds and stuff, but she like doesn't really know how to fly. And so even though she has wings, like she can't really save herself from, you know, falling to the ground. And so, you know, Rainbow Dash, she's this. And she goes off this course, and she really, really wants to be these bullies. Like, without a doubt, that's her goal. Um, but she sees her friend, and her friend is fallen. And she has this choice to make. She can save her friend, or she can win the race. Now, you guys might remember, we've, we've seen this choice made a couple times so far, and it hasn't usually been good. Uh, but I have good news for you on this one. She decides to sacrifice her ego. To sacrifice her respect to sacrifice her positioning temporarily in front of you know all these kids and the bullies she goes off the course stops racing and decides to save her friend because that's more important to her than this competition it's more important to her than um having a temporary temporarily beating these bullies uh in the race but she, she was winning the race um because she cares more about this relationship. She cares more about this friendship. She cares more about this bond than she does about her personal status or her personal reputation. Because uh, it's more important to like, save someone's life, right? And so she hops off the racetrack 
and starts like just nose diving down to, so that she can like catch Fluttershy before she just hits the ground and, and you know flats out like a pancake. And whoa, sorry. Um, so she's going down like super, super, super fast. And what's cool is called Sonic Rain Boom. So like that giant thing behind her and the huge like radius is it's that's like so she breaks like the, the idea is like she breaks the speed of sound and there's like this huge sonic rain boom behind her and like this has only happened like this is like the first time this has happened in history so you've got to go like ridiculously fast to actually have a sonic rain boom and so she has this sonic rain boom when she's like in you know kindergarten or middle school or whatever and like it's it's a legendary event it changes everything in history of uh, flying like this is the first time this happened like ever um and it's a sign that you're like a ridiculously good flyer and that you can go super super fast the only reason that that achievement occurs is because she decided to do the right thing and to save her friend and when she went down that path she decided that this was more important than winning this was more important than ego this was the reason that she had to stop everything and go hardcore to save her friend. It led to this huge, huge, huge achievement. Um, and she, I mean, it took her like 10 years to do this again. It was like ridiculously challenging. And so she was pushed to her limit, to her peak state of perform. I mean, just peak performance, absolutely crushed it. Why? She crushed it because she had a reason to. She had a drive, she had a pull, she had a goal that was pulling her so hard. Um, and this is why when you go into a new project, you go into a new workplace, you go into a new position, you want to focus all of your energy on the reason why you're doing what you're doing. And you start to have 10 times better results. She goes way faster than normal when she's flying down to save her friend because she has a very, very, very good reason to get to her before she hits the ground. And it fundamentally changes, you know, the whole course of her life is a uh, very, you know, it's, um, outperforming flyer because she put this time up front to put the energy and effort into this relationship that dragged her to this goal. Um, and then at the same time, what's cool is like, she gets to the ground, she has this uh, huge rain boom thing. And then Fluttershy learns that there's a bunch of animals on the ground, right? She'd never really been to the ground before because she can't fly. And so this is the first time she was able to get in contact with animals. The first time she was able to start to talk to them. She can kind of like talk to animals. Um, which is sort of like a weird thing that only she can do. And so she discovered that and she realized that that was an ability that she had only because of this dumb race, only because of this challenge, this event that, that brought them out of their comfort zone and forced them to try something new, to do something new and go to a new place uh, for both of them. It, it changed both of their lives, all because of this, uh, this sonic rain boom and then Fluttershy getting to be with those animals for the first time ever. So like we were talking about earlier with trying new things, a lot of times it's just getting in a new environment where you're actually physically able to try new things. Because Fluttershy, she was never physically able to be with animals until she like changed her environment, changed her state, changed her place of being and got to that forest floor where they where there were tons of animals. So that's really like really powerful stuff and the goal from there. Sweet. So Stair master. So, like we said, Fluttershy, really good with animals. And uh, we start to kind of see her uh, flex in this episode with it, which is pretty cool. So, she's got, you can kind of see those are like chickens, roosters, whatever. Um, she has, like, she runs like a mini, f mini farm. It's not really a farm, it's kind of more like just a bunch of animals that live in her backyard and around her house. And in her house, I mean, there's just animals everywhere. Um, so she's living with a ton of animals and she has like a chicken coop. And so she has some chickens that run around in her yard. Uh, and the problem, remember we talked about like that four. So like if you've got you know, the normal town over here, this is where everybody lives in Ponyville. Um, and then there's this like deadly forest over here, the Everfree Forest. And this is like super dangerous and it's got a bunch of evil monsters in it, wolves, um, bad, bad, bad stuff. So this is obviously, you know, where Fluttershy lives and she kind of lives near the, the forest, right? So this is her home. Um, and then it's a little bigger, but whatever. Uh, all of her animals kind of around in her backyard. And she's got these chickens in a uh, chicken coop, 
right here. And so the chickens, they're escaping from the chicken coop. And what she's worried about is that they're going to go over the Everfree Forest and you know mess themselves up, get hurt. And obviously doesn't want that. So what's she do? She does what a normal person would do, puts up a fence and traps them in her backyard. And it works at the beginning, but like the problem is you can set boundaries and you can force people to do what you want them to do. And you can say, look, this is the limit. You cannot go past, you can't do whatever, right? Um, but people, you know, people break the rules. So with, it's the same thing with, with Fluttershy here. Um, she set these limits in place. She put these rules in place and she's forced these chickens to, you know, stay in her backyard, but they're not going for it. They're not happy with it. And they decide that, you know, in their quest to be free and roam the land, they're going to break through like a little hole in the fence and, uh, go over to this forest and run away. And so they go underneath this hole in the fence and they start coming one by one by one, like six of these chickens escape. And they escape into a world that's like ridiculously dangerous for them. So you gotta look at it kinda like, if you step back for a minute and you look like, what do they gain, all right? What are the pros of um, you know escaping total and complete care under this, this pony who's feeding them and, and giving them a place to live? Um, well, you got adventure. And then I guess like natural exploration. And so that's, I mean, that's pretty much it, right? So if that's all they get from this, then why are they so prone to escape? Why are they so prone to leave? Um, and this is actually kind of interesting because you see this with like dogs that have electrical fences versus dogs that have physical fences. They want to get past the boundaries of where they're living. They want to break through. You know, their entire world right now is just this little backyard. And even though it's like a beautiful, beautiful backyard, they want to escape and see what else is out there in the world and try to fulfill their quote unquote potential as, uh, as chickens. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie um, and I'm bad at names so I forgot the name of it, but there's this alien invasion and the entire world like gets taken over like in the span of like eight hours by aliens and it's like ridiculously crazy and at the beginning of the movie there's this guy and he like is driving his car and you can't really tell if he did it on purpose or if he did it on an accident it's it's a little bit wishy-washy and that's kind of the point of it but he rams his car into this lady this girl who's like 17 years old driving home that night and after the collision after the cars crash she blacks out and the camera cuts and when she wakes up she's in like some room like chained to a wall and you know over the course of the movie she you know meets the guy who who hit her in the car and you know the guy says hey this you know they meet each other and he says hey i live alone um we're in my bunker there was an alien invasion and we're living in a, a safe house that I built on, in, on my farm. Um, so living underground, he says, I stockpiled enough food in here to live for the next 35, 40 years. And you know, he's like, we got board games and that's it. Um, there, we just have to live here forever now because there hasn't been an alien invasion. And I saved you because I crashed into you and I felt so bad and I brought you in my car to this safe house. And so he lets her off the chain and he says, let's, you know, basically they lived together for a, a while. And just like how these chickens were trapped, she was trapped. And first of all, she didn't really know, like, I mean, you, you, you wake up blacked out in someone's base, in someone's like fort. Like, you don't know if there's been an alien invasion or not. She looks out the window, you know, you walk up the stairs to the safe house and she looks out this window and there's like, she doesn't see anything wrong. She just sees a beautiful farm. And so she's like, I want to escape. I want to get out of here. And so she like plans for the next, you know, movie, basically the rest of the movie. Like she's plotting how she's going to, she steals this guy's keys and like breaks out. And as soon as she breaks out, there are like alien zombies everywhere. And like the whole world's been invested and taken over and tons and tons of danger, destruction. She has to like zom fight zombie aliens with like shotguns and like risk her life and almost die. Then the, the caretaker guy gets murdered by the aliens and it's just insane. Why did that happen? Why did she escape? Why did she go into danger and literally kill people? It's because she wanted to fulfill her potential. She wanted to escape.
That's the exact same mentality that these chickens have right here as they go under this fence into this dangerous place because they just don't know any better. Um, just like this girl, she just didn't know any better. These chickens don't know any better. And so that's kind of the mentality behind these guys trying to, to escape here is that they, they want to be somewhere else. They want to be in a new place, in a new world. And so they escape into the forest and Fluttershy realizes that they're gone and she freaks out and she's like, what the heck, dude? And she just goes in the forest to try to find him because she sees the hole in the fence. And basically there's this thing called the cockatrice, which is like a thing, it's a thing. And it looks like a chicken, but like it's evil. And so when you look into its eyes, like it turns you into stone. So it's like fake, but whatever. Um, and so the chickens basically, there was like cockatrices in this deadly forest and it turned like two of the chickens into stone. And so the other ones run back and they freak out. And Fluttershy goes and she finds the stone chickens and she realizes what happened. And she has to like un turn them out of stone or whatever. But what she uses here is, is this, you know, stare master. Um, is something that she calls the stare. And what she'll do is she'll just take these animals and just furiously stare at them. And, you know, the idea is that her magic stare is what uh, can bring these animals into a trance. And uh, she can control them by staring at them. And then they get super scared and they listen to her because she's in a position of authority. This is how she establishes dominance, uh, which is actually kind of how you establish dominance with most like dogs, so it, it makes sense. Um, and so that's how she gets them to listen to her. Only with like a threat of like, I am dominant. And only after that they are, you know, these chickens are totally convinced that she's the leader that they desire, do they listen to her? Do they grow with her? And do they actually like participate with her and listen to what she says uh, as a caretaker and as someone who's looking out for their best interests? Um, so they go towards fear, they go towards danger, they go towards death because they just don't know any better. Um, and this happens so often, like if you're working with a group, or you're working with a team, you're working with new friends. You've got to establish respect so that people will listen to you if you know what's right for them. And so you can have the best growth for the group, the best development of the people in the group, and the best uh, overarching growth by focusing on what's really best and what you know is best for them.